I have very little courage. It, it's very easy in UK politics saying what you think uh, if you're on the right. People who have the real courage are um, people like um, uh, the, the lady who ran for the leadership of the SNP, who on a party of the left expressed similar views uh, because she was absolutely pilloried for that. And it was thought that somebody of her views could not stand for a, quote, a progressive party. Now on the right, there is much more tolerance. The, the, the right in modern times is the party of tolerance, whereas the left has become intolerant. Right Honourable Jacob Rees-Mogg is the Conservative Member of Parliament for North East Somerset in the West Country of England. Along with other senior political officers, he previously served as the Leader of the House of Commons and the Lord President of the Council, the fourth of the great officers of state in the United Kingdom. He's the author of three books and he hosts State of the Nation on GB News. Jacob, thank you so very much for your time here in London in your own home. It's, it's very good of you indeed. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for coming. You've had a much longer journey. Well, yes, it is a long way from Australia to Britain, but always worth the trip. Now, it would be fair to say that you're a Conservative both, I think, by party affiliation and by uh, for, uh, your own philosophical approach. Um, many would deride conservatism and do deride it today as a mere preservation of the status quo against change, against progress. In your view, can you just give us a feel, how would you describe the philosophy of conservatism and why you believe in it? Yes, I think the idea that conservatism is just against change is wrong. I think what conservatism is about is, first of all, an understanding of human nature and then the relationship of the individual to the state and how society is created and how through that you create the best, most successful, most prosperous society. And part of that is constitutional, that we have learned that if you have a constitution that is based on freedom of speech, the rights of property, the rule of law and democracy, you become prosperous. If you look at all the most prosperous countries in the world, they have those four aspects to their constitution. And the people who seek to change that, the radicals, are ones who I think risk our prosperity. But you also want to look at the proportionality of the state. Does the state need to do it? Because the state is built up from individuals, not the other way round. The family, um, in terms of Leo XIII in his encyclical Rerum Novarum, predates the state. And therefore, it has rights and freedoms that lead to the creation of the state. And that seems to me to be a conservative underpinning of the policies that one then wants to implement as a politician. Where do you think a conservative can find touch points in other political philosophies that they can constructively engage with and work with and, if you like, respect? Well, I think there is an element of conservatism that touches with liberalism, that if you take economics, the 19th century liberal economic prescription is one that is pretty attractive. It ties in with allowing people to get on with their own lives, with understanding the primacy of individual liberty, and then applies it in an economic field, which has gained the tag of economic liberalism. But I think it's not in any way uh, in contradiction to conservatism. I know in my own country, I found uh, in my earlier days in the parliament that Whilst I vehemently disagreed with their approach to the management of the economy and so forth, there were some of the old-fashioned, if I can use that word, socialists in terms of their objectives, you know, picking up the disadvantaged, the marginalised, and trying to ensure that they were part of family Australia, gave me a basis upon which I could at least talk and then discuss the reasons that I didn't think their actual policies were the right way to achieve them. But there was something at a human level that we could communicate on. Now, what I'm driving at is that that seems to be being washed out of the system now, unless you agree with me and unless you're aligned with my philosophy. I think I agree with you on both parts, that I, it was very noticeable at the last general election, the red wall in the UK that Boris managed to 
appeal to and get to vote Conservative. Why did they vote Conservative? Well, it was an alignment of values, but they hadn't changed their values so much as the Labour Party had abandoned its values. So what, what did these people believe in? They were patriotic. They loved their country. Now, the Labour Party in the UK, historically, had been a very patriotic party. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't. Uh, he was very much an internationalist, very suspicious uh, of patriotism. Um, he'd been in talks with the political wing of the RA in the 1980s. He'd been sympathetic to those hostile to the nation state. And that was rejected by Labour voters. And I also agree with your point about wanting um, to lift all boats, that the traditional socialist wanted people who were least well off to be better off. Now they seem to be much more focused on what have become called woke issues, on what you say and what you think. And if you disagree, you are a bad person. And that's a big change in, in politics. I wouldn't say it's yet infected the House of Commons, but in broader politics, and I think particularly for younger people, they do feel that if they express a view that isn't fashionable, they are um, deemed to be a bad person. If I can come to the term social conservatism, can I ask you how you would describe that and why you see it as good for society, particularly in the context of the, the line, I've always thought it was a bit of a home goal with people in the conservative country movement in this country saying, we're seen as the nasty party. And the minute you say, we're seen that way, you're, you've allowed others to define you and you're owning it, it seems to me. But that's an aside. Social conservatism and why it's good for, for society. Well, I think it's an important aside. I never thought the Conservative Party was the nasty party. I remember that speech made um, by Theresa May very well because the next day I was speaking to a Conservative group and it was uh, in Shropshire, the Conservative Women's Group. And there you had all these people who had worked for years for the Conservative Party, who also did all the charitable work in their local communities. You know, they ran the village fete, all those sorts of things. And suddenly they'd been told they were nasty. So I thought it was wrong, foolish thing to say, um, and misunderstood what conservatism was about. Again, back to my point on the family being the building block of society rather than the other way around, and therefore of the, of the state. The Conservatives ought to support the family because it helps individuals in their lives. The success of people who are brought up in a stable family is statistically better than those who are not brought up in a stable family. But, and the but is very important, it's not for politicians to be judgmental on how others lead their lives, but it is for politicians to allow people the freedom to lead their lives. What we have currently in the UK, and I don't know if this is also true in Australia, is a benefit and tax system that is actively hostile to the family. You are worse off in a family than not in a family. This can't be sensible. So I don't want to go back to a time where you stigmatize people living in other groupings or make their life more difficult um, or, or make it harder for single parent families who have a pretty tough time for all sorts of reasons. I don't want to penalize or pillory them, but I do want to support the traditional family because I think it's helpful for society overall. Uh, and I suspect is, is important in terms of economic outcomes ultimately. Well, I think that's absolutely right, that, that if, you, if you look at um, success at school, if you look at the prison population, uh, and you correlate that with um, children in care, it's a particularly difficult picture. If you correlate it with broken homes altogether, it is a difficult picture. So the stability uh, that you get from being in a traditional family is very helpful to people growing up and to their families. Uh, as I say, this doesn't mean you want to criticise people whose lives haven't worked out that way or have made other choices. They must be free to do that. But you don't want to have policies that actually make family life harder. We do seem to be living in an age of um, sort of quite radical self-autonomy, you know, um, the idea that somehow the greatest virtue is that I am who I feel almost, that I am. And that sometimes I think creates awkward dynamics uh, in that that set of virtues is not particularly friendly to community, including family. It can be a bit 
anarchic, anarchaic, a bit, uh, you know, uh, anti-organised government and, and, and stability, uh, and certainly anti-religion. So you've got a bit of a clash there with this modern idea, I think, of the virtue of self-autonomy and what we've seen as the essential ingredients of a cohesive and cooperative society. Well, people can identify as they wish. They're completely free to do it. But am I obliged to accept how they identify? There was in the papers recently that somebody had come to the United Kingdom from America and had identified as being British. Well, that doesn't entitle him to a passport. Uh, and he may think he's British. Marvellous. I'm more in favour of people thinking that <laughs> British great thing. But that doesn't entitle you to the rights of a British citizen. It doesn't give you a vote. It doesn't give you a passport. It doesn't give you a national insurance number. And uh, so I think people are entitled to say what they wish. It's a free country. But equally, others are entitled not to change their behaviour in accordance with somebody's whim. This has been the genius, I think, of Western uh, civilization over the last few hundred years. We've evolved to the point, until it seems recently, that we were able to accommodate one another's deepest differences in a way that's been quite unique. Uh, and one worries a little that it's under attack. Yes, I, I mean, I think there is an intolerance. Um, and the intolerance mainly comes from the left, not from the right. Uh, I see this uh, on, uh, I do a television program for GB News, I see this with some people that I interview, that people on the right who I disagree with uh, don't automatically think that I'm a bad person because of it. Some people on the left just assume if you disagree you must be bad. And the right very rarely feels that towards the left. This is a... Intolerance is a bad thing, it's bad for the cohesion of society. But it's also a desperate arrogance because if you look at human history, you go back all through whatever records there are, we make terrible mistakes. We all believe things which then turn out a hundred years later to have been wrong, unpleasant, false, based on bad information. And therefore one ought to have a certain humility about one's own views and certainties. Um, talking of certainties, we've got a you know, very vigorous debate going on in all of our countries now about uh, you know, the whole issue of transgender identity. And, and I think you've been on record as saying that single sex spaces need protection. And we've seen some very ugly clashes over this in Australia. And we read of some terrible things happening happened in this country, frankly, where there have, there's been a lack of protection, particularly for women in certain situations. Um, how do you think this debate uh, might, might unfold? What, what would you say is that, from your perspective is the right way to understand philosophically transgenderism and the trans movement? Well, I, I think that it, it, the real issue is about the protection of women. That the single sex spaces uh, for women are there to protect them from men. And a man who wakes up in the morning and says, actually, I'm a woman, so that I can go into a woman's changing room, should not be allowed to do so. And in my view, most reasonable people think that is the case. You, you cannot self-identify without going through any procedure or any medical um, interaction as of an opposite sex and expect to be treated in that way. And we've seen this with um, sporting activities as well. And so I think it's really just common sense. It's not particularly difficult. And to my mind, this is what most people think. I think this is what my constituents overwhelmingly think. That doesn't mean that there will be a small number of people, as a very distinguished historian, James Morris, who became Jan Morris, who um, had an operation and so on and so forth, and lived as a woman. And I think if people go through that full procedure, then it's a very different situation. I still wouldn't necessarily say they could compete in female competitions because they have an inherent advantage uh, of um, the male physique. Um, you, you've taken a position that would be not unusual in conservative politics in America in relation to being pro-life, but in your country and in mine and in many other Western countries, it's anathema. 
why is it that there are such different perspectives in America? You know, it's a f subject of fierce debate, but there's no debate. It's a sort of, it's a dead deal. We're not going to reopen it. Yawn, go back to sleep. You're, you know, you're just out of order sort of approach uh, in so many other cultures. How does that a uh, differentiation arise and how do, you, how do we understand it? It's, it's very interesting. I, I wouldn't necessarily want the UK to have the US politicization of life issues because I think they are above and beyond party politics. Uh, I think politicians have closed it down because it's too awkward, but I think they're out of touch with voters. Now, I'm not saying that voters take my view because I don't think they do. I, I, I think they don't take the teaching of the Catholic Church to their starting point on where life begins. But where they do disagree with the consensus uh, is, as far as opinion polling is concerned, they are strongly against, in the UK, sex-selective abortions, which yes. they think are wrong. They are increasingly concerned about allowing abortions up to full term for any disability, which is, I think, a terrible thing that happens in this country. And the bulk of the population are actively against this when asked. And they also would mostly like to see, um, and interestingly more women than men, a reduction in the number of weeks from 24 weeks down to a lower level. And, and I think politicians shy away from it because they think you're either for abortion to full term or you're against it after the moment of conception. But in fact, the bulk of voters in Britain uh, would like to see greater control greater safeguards, uh, and um, the removal of things that are clearly wrong. I mean, the, the abortion to term of disabled babies is, to my mind, so wrong. Uh, we have a society that has become increasingly sympathetic to and helpful to the disabled, but only once they're born. Before they're born, they are disposable. I just think this is awful, but so do most of the British people. I must say that I think one of the most insightful commentators in contemporary Britain, uh, and somebody I must say I'm very fond of personally, uh, is uh, the amazing Peter Hitchens. Uh, but he makes a case that the Conservative Party hasn't really been Conservative for a couple of decades. Any comments on that? Uh, how do you feel about his perspectives? Do you share them? Are you optimistic that, uh, in fact, uh, the embers can be stoked back into a fire? Well, I share your high regard for Peter Hitchens. I think he is a very interesting thinker and a good writer and challenges conservatives in an effective uh, way whilst being broadly on our, our side. I think the Conservative Party lost its confidence after Tony Blair won three elections in a row. And we came to the conclusion between 2005 and 2010 that the only way to be elected was to be a bit more like New Labour. And we tried that. We then still didn't win the election. But we have then governed in that way. Well, certainly we did in the coalition because we had no choice. The Lib Dems were there. Then we haven't had much of a majority in 20, until 2019. Then when we got a majority, we were hit by COVID and were dealing with Brexit, which was a very conservative thing to do, but was slightly above and beyond conservatism. So I think there is truth in his analysis and what Conservatives need to do is to make the case. We need to make the case for Conservatism. Why will this make people better off? Why is it... The Archbishop of Canterbury, who I actually hold in very high regard, I think he is a genuinely holy man, was speaking about immigration yesterday and saying that um, the policy of sending people to Rwanda was immoral. Now, we need to make the case for why Conservatism is, in fact, moral and good, in my view, sending people to Rwanda is moral and good because it breaks the stranglehold of people traffickers on an illegal trade that is risking people's lives coming across the channel. That seems to me a morally good thing to do. And it requires action to be taken to deter people from coming. And the best way of doing that, that we have been able to come up with, is to send them to Rwanda. And actually Australia did something similar and reduce the number of deaths of people trying to get to Australia. Because you had people coming in leaky boats and all sorts of terrible things. Large numbers of deaths. Large numbers of deaths. And those stopped. Mm. Now, surely that is moral. 
And conservatives shouldn't be frightened of making the moral case when the left is making the moral case against us. I think you raised two really interesting points there that I, I feel people on the centre and the centre-right are not as good at as people from the left. The first is make a case, build a constituency. I hear some of those who have followed me saying, John, there's no constituency for economic reform or for tax reform or for debt reduction. I don't know that there ever was. You've got to go out and build it. You've got to make the case. And then the second point that I think you raise is that the left is extraordinarily good at prefacing every policy prescription or pronouncement with a moral statement. They go to the heart first and then try, if they ever do, to reach the head, whereas centre-right people tend to be cold, analytical, this is the way we'll do it because this is the way to get a sweet set of numbers. We've got to, I think, if it's an economic argument, for example, state the moral case. Good economics is good outcomes for people. But I mean, and we're not very good at it. completely agree with you. Um, you have to make the case. It's very interesting. Um, you all know this better than I do. But I believe not that many years ago, Australia was thinking about introducing identity cards. And opinion polls showed something like 80% of people were in favour of identity cards. The case was then made against identity cards, at which point about 80% of people were against identity cards. And one should make the case and not be too influenced by opinion polls. If I say to you, would you like more taxes to fund the NHS? You will all, you probably won't, but most people say yes, because why it's a good and nice thing to do. When I come to you and say, okay, can I have an extra 5% of your income? You say, no, why should I give you that? And you've got to think through what people mean in opinion polls and whether they are just saying something that they think sounds good and nice to the person they're talking to, or whether they absolutely believe and understand the case. And conservatives need to make the case better. And we need to show that actually our well thought through prescriptions are more caring and better for society as a whole than the Labour Party is wearing its heart on its sleeve. I can think of another area where opinion polls say everybody's demanding action and we've got to tackle the problem. It's called climate change. But then if you turn around and ask how much they're prepared to pay for it, it turns out to be not very much. I don't think it's a very honest debate. I know in my own country it really worries me that, it, that everyone's saying we want action. I think we're responsible for 1.1% now in net terms of global emissions, even though we're a major energy exporter. But everyone wants action. And what worries me is a social impact when people realise how expensive that action is because they're not being told. They're actually being, I think, nothing short of misled when they're told that the switch to renewables will reduce power cost. There's no evidence of that anywhere in the world for a variety of reasons. You know, renewable energy is basically only cheap once you put the infrastructure there during the 30% of the time that the wind and the sun blow. Filling in the gaps makes it a very expensive way to go. And yet there's no acknowledgement, there's no honest dealing with people. And I think they're just... In the long term, I worry that it just builds more cynicism. Well, I think you're absolutely right. We had the second reading of an energy bill a couple of days ago in Parliament, and this will put huge cost on consumers. This ignores the fact that last September, when energy prices went up, nobody was willing to pay them. But the reason energy prices went up was at least in part because uh, of the effort to get to net zero. Why do I say that? Well, we haven't done the things that we would otherwise have done to ensure our own energy supply. We had had something of a moratorium on issuing licenses to drill in the North Sea. We hadn't got on with extracting shale gas. So once you don't get the basic resource of fossil fuels, you find you've got a shortage, prices go up. And what happens when prices go up? People say to the government, this is impossible, we must be bailed out. So the government then intervenes to subsidise the costs that the government itself has created. And this is, this is absolute madness. And ultimately, voters won't stand for it because governments don't have any money. So when you get your um, energy bill and it's a third of what it might have been because of a government subsidy, that two thirds is still being paid by you. It's just being paid in taxation rather than uh, on your energy bill. You, 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 I think I'm correct in saying a strong supporter of Brexit. Yes. Um, since then, we've had COVID. We've had 
endless drawn out negotiations and so forth and the perception that the British economy is not doing well, that it faces ongoing headwinds, uh, like most Western economies, a lot of unfunded liabilities coming down the road that nobody's really focusing on and that would probably prefer everyone forgot about. You're essentially optimistic, of course. What's the roadmap for Britain if it's to recover its prosperity and opportunities for people from where it stands now, as you said? It's a very general question, I know, but you will have thought about it a lot. I know that. Indeed. The, the thing about Brexit is that first and foremost, it's about democracy. Who should govern us? Should it be the people elected in the UK or should it be unelected people in Brussels? Now, the risk with that is that we might elect worse people than the bureaucrats in Brussels. That's not impossible. We might have elected Jeremy Corbyn, but we were entitled to do it. And if Jeremy Corbyn had had a mandate, he would have been entitled to carry it out. Now, having said that, I have a very clear view of what I think we should be doing economically. But to go back to our earlier point, I have to sell that to the electorate so they will want to vote Conservative to do it. And what is that? Well, it's free trade. I'm delighted we uh, have got a free trade agreement with Australia, which will have a much bigger economic effect than the modelers uh, predicting that um, uh, the gravity models of trade uh, don't work, they're out of date, they don't really understand how services work either. So I think that's a really positive action. We need more of those. And we need to be bold about free trade because actually unilateral free trade makes you more prosperous. Uh, we need to deregulate. Uh, the government's just given up on repealing EU rules. We need to cut through vast swathes of EU rules so that we can be a more competitive economy because EU regulation is all about creating a protected market for European country companies within a European sphere. We want to have an open market that is low cost that people will want to invest in uh, and will come here to invest in but also sell their goods into, which benefits UK consumers. So it's about open free market uh, economics, low regulation, and looking globally. And our relationship with Australia is very important in this, the free trade deal, but also AUKUS, because I think we have a role uh, as a global strategic player, as well as simply a global trading partner. I was very interested in uh, just teasing out this issue of why you believe that uh, the trade agreement between Australia and UK will be of more value, presumably to both economies, than people have realised. Yes, the forecast has been done on the basis of gravity models, and gravity models are inherently unreliable. So um, economists worked through them on what would happen if the UK joined the euro and thought it would boost our trade initially by 300%, then revise down to 200% uh, with the European Union. Now, there was no evidence for this in the countries that did join the euro. Gravity models assume that your trade will be more with the nations to which you are closest. But actually, that misses out that so much of trade is now in services, which aren't particularly sensitive to distance, but also that transport costs, shipping costs, are relatively low and a relatively low proportion of the total cost of sales. So you've tended to find, and certainly um, Australia and the US found, that the removal of trade barriers led to much faster increases in trade than were predicted by the models. Well, that's good news. Um, to return to um, the broader economic outcome uh, or outlook for Britain, and this has always been an innovative country. That if the structures are right, one assumes that Britain's capacity to reinvent itself and go forward is sound. But at the moment, it looks a bit grim. And in particular, you've got a lot of underfunded liabilities coming towards you, uh, pension schemes and so on and so forth. How do you see it more broadly? Um, I, I think you encapsulate it very well, that the basic constitutional settlement is sound and it supports the rights of property and freedom of speech, so you, you tend not to have a corrupt political uh, settlement and that's pretty fundamental to prosperity in the long run. But we have put burdens on ourselves that have made us less competitive. So we've become the highest tax that we've been in 70 years. We've adopted EU regulations, which makes us a highly regulated economy. H how do you deal with that? Well, we have the ability to do that through um, Parliament if we can get conservative messages across and can move to a more efficient 
uh, open market. So that must be the aim um, economically for the UK. Can we do that? Uh, yes, I think we can, because as you say, we have the right foundations in place. We often refer to the British Parliament as the mother of the parliaments. And it's very easy, I think, to overlook that really modern freedom, modern liberty springs from Britain. There are people who think that's an antiquated view or irrelevant or whatever. I don't think it is at all. It's not France. It wasn't the French Revolution. Not America, in fact, but from Britain. And I just wonder whether younger Britons really understand how important liberty is to a flourishing society. And maybe the love for liberty is, if you like, being squashed by calls for sustainability, for diversity, for safety, for comfort, uh, a little unthinkingly, perhaps? I mean, I think you're right. I think the teaching of history in schools is not what it was. So people used to be taught the kings and queens of England, and that was their base for understanding English and then British history. And through that, you understood how our liberties had evolved, and whether that's uh, from Magna Carta in 1215, or, or it's the... Um, a glorious Revolution in 1688 or the Great Reform Bill in 1832, you, you saw how liberty was um, bought effectively uh, and how power went from the autocratic arms of the state to the democratic arms of the state. And the great thing about the US Constitution is that it is an aim to codify and perfect the British Constitution, which the uh, writers of it greatly admired. And it's absolutely fascinating. If you look at the US Bill of Rights, it includes in it the right to bear arms. The right to bear arms is in the British, the English, strictly, Bill of Rights, though oddly ours is the right to bear arms for the maintenance of a Protestant militia, which as a Catholic, I'm quite glad, has fallen out of fashion. <laughs> uh, but but a lo uh, And the US Constitution has uh, things on acts of attainder won't happen. Well, acts of attainder had actually stopped happening um, by the 1780s in the UK anyway, but they were trying to stop things that they thought of as abuses and put them in their constitution. So if you look at the history of liberty, I absolutely agree with you, it emerges from um, the English political approach, uh, helped by the Scottish uh, joining in at a, at a later stage. And interestingly, you can trace it back to the Anglo-Saxons that the Normans adopt quite a lot of the Anglo-Saxons institutions with one fundamental principle, which is why it's not the French, fundamental principle of English law, and you saw this at the, at the coronation, is that the king is the king under the law, he is not the king above the law. And the French king was always the king above the law, and the French state after the revolution carried on as if the state was still the royal state, it just didn't have a king anymore. On the coronation, and this may be interesting um, as we share a, a king, um, look what happens. It doesn't happen by accident. What is the first thing the king does? The very beginning of it, he takes an oath. Then he is acclaimed by the people. Then he is anointed by God. Why is the sequencing so important? Well, he's only anointed by God once he's been acclaimed by the people, and he's only acclaimed by the people once he has agreed to rule according to the laws of the land. And William the Conqueror did the same. So the whole history of kingship in England is a king who is acclaimed by the people because he's entered into a contract. Then God comes along and anoints him, or the archbishop, but the, the, the archbishop acting on behalf of God. And that's really, really important because the power is a conditional contractual power that the state has. What would you say to people who doubt the value of a monarchy, or watched the ceremony, wrote as they did in some of our newspapers that this is weird, out of touch, has no relevance, has no meaning? Interestingly, there are people who would never say, would never, would absolutely do you over in Australia if you criticised Aboriginal rituals, for example, but our own somehow are to be dismissed? You presumably would defend them and point to their values. What would be your essential argument? Um, you've always got to be very careful about ritual because if it becomes ritual for its own sake, it is 
pointless it becomes Ruritanian. And then people laugh at it and they don't take it seriously. The question is, what does the ritual symbolize? And the ritual symbolizes the structure of our constitution and both our constitutions, that they are um, bottom-up concepts that lead inevitably to a pinnacle that is the head of state. Now, whether that head of state is a monarch or uh, is a governor general doesn't particularly matter. It matters how you construct your state and what the basis of power is. And the Constitution, as a very occasional event, symbolizes that in a way that I think reminds people of how they are in fact governed. Um, Republics do it every four or five years when they uh, inaugurate a president. There's much less ceremony involved in that because you're doing it regularly and people perhaps think less about the structures of their state in republics. But I think the symbolism illustrates, points to, reminds us of something that is both important and beneficial. So it's not the coaches. I mean, you may like the coaches or you may not like the coaches. They're, they're part of the grandeur of it. It's that actual ceremony that is really very important and links us back, of course, to our history as well and the stability that our constitution has given us and stability is essential for prosperity. Unstable states are never prosperous. I was in America when the Queen became very ill. And it, it, where I was, it was very, very early in the morning. I'd woken early because my body clock was out because I was in another country. Uh, and uh, the major programming was all interrupted in America, Republican or America, of course, you know, that broke away from Britain. Um, the, the news services were saturated with uh, uh, minute by minute coverage of what was unfolding in Britain. They don't have a monarchy. They rejected the model. Their forefathers argued endlessly. You got cancelled if you were an American uh, founding father who indicated that there might be some value in the British model of monarchy. And yet here they are, having rejected the idea, totally absorbed, as I realised, uh, with the idea of the British monarch passing on. Very interesting. It, it, it is very interesting, and it's a very British thing because although the Queen was the second longest reigning monarch in history, um, she'd only just overtaken the recently deceased King of Thailand, uh, who people hadn't reacted in this way to. And when Emperor Hirohito of Japan died after a very long reign, they didn't react to him in that way either. I think it is the symbolism of monarchy that is so important, and to your point, the monarchy is an indication of liberty that is important, the liberty that the British constitution, the British model has brought. That's why it's interesting, that's why Americans are interested. It's not just the celebrity culture. Um, though I also think that the Queen was a very remarkable woman, that, that the role she carried out so well for such a long time was tremendously important over a, a difficult and uncertain period. The servant model of leadership. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. In an age when we recognise its value, if four billion people, I don't know how they measure these things, tapped in to watch it, but it's not, our, not really our value anymore. You know, we increasingly teach our children that it's not about serving others, it's about you. You're the centre of the universe. When we see that on the stage, when we think our political leaders think it's about them, not about us, we actually, in a strange way, reject the value system we're instilling in our children, don't we? I think politicians always have to be very, very careful to remember uh, that they are there on behalf of the British people or the Australian people. They're not there because they themselves are so marvellous. And I think it's one of the good things about um, the first-past-the-post system. So every weekend I go back to my constituency and almost every weekend I have a surgery where anyone can come and see me and can tell me um, what I'm doing wrong and what they want me to do better. And I, I have one constituent who was rude to my staff. And so I said to him, you're not allowed to be rude to my staff, but you are allowed to be rude to me. I'm your member of parliament. So a few weeks later, he rang up and said to one of my parliamentary assistants, I want to be rude to Jacob. So I took the telephone and he was rude to me. That's his right. And it's very important and it's very direct. And particularly as you go from being a backbencher to being a minister, it's easy to get disconnected from your voters. And our system of weekly surgeries helps keep our politicians 
directly linked to remember what they are there to do. And things like parliamentary privilege. What is my main parliamentary privilege? Anything I say in the House of Commons cannot be questioned in another court. So I can't be sued for libel if I say it in the House of Commons. That sort of privilege for me, because I am uh, important, it is a privilege for my constituents so I can speak up on their behalf. Likewise, uh, I have a right of unhindered access, it's phrased as unmolested access, but that gives me the wrong impression, to um, the House of Commons at any time when Parliament is um, in existence, not uh, between dissolutions. That's not there for me. That is there so that I can always get there, and I can't have some official saying to me, where's your pass, or um, you've got to go around that way, because I have to be there to represent the interests of my constituents. And it is important to remember the privileges are about your constituency, not about you as an individual. I can't help just uh, reflecting for a moment, surgery, as you call it, making yourself available in your office for your constituents. It's a little easier in a country of this size. My one constituency was the size of your country. Uh, that is why we're, it, it is easier for us and, and for Australians and American politicians it is obviously much harder because of the numbers or the size or both. But perhaps your constituents present you with more difficult problems. So. Well, I, don't Swings know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, COVID, you know, uh, we all now I think look back and well, certainly in my country with some concern about how we handle it. And you've expressed some strong views. I think uh, such eminent people as uh, Lord Jonathan Sumption uh, have expressed the same views. I think they, to my way of thinking, they go to the heart a little bit of the idea of who owns our liberties? <laughs> are they somehow the gift of government or are they ours that we surrender only to the extent that we need to for the common good? And shouldn't we be more recognising of the fact that it's not for governments to gift us freedoms, it is for them to defend them, sometimes against their own interests and desires, but it's their job to defend them and to recognise that they, it's in the same theme as you talking about serving the electorate, serving the people rather than lording it over them. I was in government at the time, so I was bound by collective responsibility. Um, and I was reading Jonathan Sumpton and was thinking, good heavens, this man is talking sense. Um, that uh, I, I know him anyway, but then I've always thought extraordinarily highly of him. And what he was saying just seemed to me to be right. The answer that unfortunately was given regularly in government circles was that lockdowns were polling very well. People wanted to be told what to do. And frankly, that's not good enough, that people have rights over their own lives. And where I think we got it wrong and I think Australia got it more wrong than we did, actually, was that after the first lockdown, which was legitimate because we didn't know. Didn't know. Yeah, we were uh, in the dark at that point. And it time. could have been much worse than it mm. was. By the second lockdown, we knew it wasn't actually that dangerous. And we also knew that people were broadly pretty sensible, that people were inevitably flexing the rules. I mean, inevitably, as a politician, I was being as careful as I possibly could be. I assumed there was a photographer from a left-wing newspaper in the garden on the basis that if you assumed that, you'd probably behave well, uh, or at least within the rules. But I think lots of my constituents allowed the rules to be uh, um, not looked at too carefully once we got in the second and subsequent lockdowns. And the government should have reacted to that rather than thinking it could force people to do things. I hope, and I think this is potentially very good news, that if any government ever tried this again, nobody would take any notice. I think the government exceeded its ability to tell people what to do, and by the end of it, people had had enough, and subsequently they realised it was nonsense anyway. So you take all this mask wearing that we had to do, which I didn't like doing. I did maintain the right of members of parliament not to have to wear masks on the grounds of our unhindered access. You, you cannot create a new rule for a member of parliament without primary legislation, however trivial it may seem. Um, but now people know wearing masks didn't do them any good or anybody else any good. Why would you wear a mask again? So I, I, I think people wouldn't put up with it uh, uh, on another occasion. So perhaps <clears throat> there's some good that can come out of this. It might check governments in the future. 
Uh, Jacob, you allude to the way Australia is perceived on the international stage. There's, there's, I actually participated in a television program in America, two hours, whatever has happened to the Australians, that they allowed themselves to be so tied down and lent on, particularly in the state of Victoria, Melbourne. Uh, it is a wide held, uh, widely held perception. I, I, I would hope on the other side, which is to raise a new topic, uh, that we might be seen as having been quite plucky and to have stood for our own interests when it comes to the way that the Chinese Communist Party has been behaving. Well, I'm very pleased to come on to that. Um, I'm happy to answer. Uh, uh, I was astonished by Australia of all countries um, with lots of space being as um, locked down as it was uh, and then finding it very difficult to get out of lockdown uh, and the Australian people putting up with it. It, it, it. But then nobody expected. I, I sat in on meetings at the beginning of lockdown where the experts said to us, well, you will have lockdown fatigue and we must bring in lockdown late because if we bring it in too early, you'll have lockdown fatigue and people won't be taking any notice of it when you really, really need it. That turned out not to be true, that people were happy to be locked down for months and months. Um, but on China, I cannot tell you how much I admire the courage of Australia to its own economic risk of standing up to a totalitarian regime and leading the Western world. That, that the Western world, the US and the UK, were going along with this um, golden age view of China that we could deal with them, ignoring every human rights abuse that was going on in China, the treatment of the Uyghurs, and then the treatment of Hong Kong, and just thinking this could all go along swimmingly. And it was Australia that stood up and said, no, this is not right. Um, we are going to do something about it. You had trade sanctions then slapped on you. You didn't back down. I think you then sold your iron ore to other countries for just as good prices. So the economic effect was not as bad as expected. And then the US and the UK changed. And I, I think this is really important, actually, in terms of, um, there's an awful word, geopolitics, but I can't think of a better one, because it shows what an important, free, mid-sized country can do to change the view of the Western world for the better and for the stronger to stand up for our shared values. I would give quite a bit of credit to Japan as well. And they've got some baggage in this area, to be honest, from the 1930s and 40s. But nonetheless, uh, they have made it very plain that uh, they will do their bit. And I think that is an emboldening between the two countries. It's emboldening the region to say, well, we don't have to sacrifice our freedoms and our opportunities to a very authoritarian regime. Always important to distinguish between the Chinese people and the regime. Okay. Yes, I mean, it is a totalitarian uh, communist regime, uh, and that is not the fault of the Chinese people. They never get a chance to vote for it. But you're right about Japan, and you're right about how Japan has been trying to handle this as tactfully as possible with the difficult history. It's very important. There was an agreement between Japan and South Korea very recently. Yes. And that is... Uh, I, I used to be an emerging markets investor um, and also included Asia. So I used to go to South Korea quite often. And the um, view of Japan because of the war and because of colonialism is not enormously positive. So that Japan and South Korea are cooperating is, I think, a really important step forward. I'd be very interested in your views on, on, on the geopolitical outlook. Firstly, AUKUS, it plainly troubles Beijing deeply, which tells you that I think maybe they're worried by the coming together. It really reflects what's happened in relation to the Ukraine. The West is not quite as decadent and as degenerate and divided as they thought, and they are prepared to stand by their values. That's encouraging. How do you see AUKUS? Uh, then you've talked about the trade relationship between Australia and Britain, but AUKUS is a very new development that will have major implications beyond the geopolitical, I think, in binding 
a mid-level country, Australia, uh, with Britain and America. I'd be very interested in your thoughts on it. I think it's really very important. I think it's, from a British point of view, a benefit of Brexit. We could not have done it if we were in the European Union and bound by the doctrine of sincere cooperation with the EU's foreign policy, which would have overridden AUKUS. And as you remember, the French were very angry about AUKUS and we would have found it impossible to do. Um, I think it is a reflection of actually two mid-sized countries, Australia and the UK, being able to influence the progress of the West because for the US to have done it on its own would have been impractical. It needed partners um, and it needed in a way validating because I think the US after Iraq and Afghanistan has become quite sensitive about its international involvement for which it gets very little thanks and a great deal of criticism. And therefore to do something with two willing partners of a smaller size who were willing to take a lot of publicity around it was I think helpful to bring the US out of the renewed isolation that the withdrawal from Afghanistan had created and the humiliation of the withdrawal from Afghanistan as well. So I think it was important in so many ways, important for the UK re-establishing itself as um, globally interested, important for Australia in seeing benefits of what it had done previously in standing up to China and getting Western support and important for the US in allowing it slightly to come out of its shell. It's really, really fundamental importance. And I'd like to see the UK go further. Um, Australia's involved in the in the Quad with Japan and India and the US as well. I'd like to see us join that because I think that is the route to global security. These are dangerous times. I can't not ask you your views on Ukraine and uh, I might preface uh, uh, the uh, the request that you tell us what you think by saying that I look on and worry about how it might end. I worry about the extraordinary commitment by the Americans, the potential for it to impact in various ways, um, economically, uh, the supply of limited weaponry, uh, enthusiasm for you know, engagement internationally at a time when we would like their focus to be very clearly, frankly, on the Pacific region. And we wonder, we see Britain doing a lot of heavy lifting. We wonder a bit about Europe. And I particularly think perhaps the French and the Germans could do a bit more so that the Americans weren't quite so heavily burdened here at a time of great danger elsewhere. I think the greatest danger in the Pacific would have been if we'd done nothing in Ukraine because it would have shown that the international order had broken down, that it was a free-for-all, and what would have stopped China invading Taiwan overnight, whenever they felt like it. So uh, I wouldn't worry that you are less secure because of the US commitment to Ukraine. And you are absolutely right. One should always think, what is the exit? But there are some times when you have to enter even if you don't know what the exit is. Uh, this was very definitely one of those times because I agree with that. If Putin had succeeded again after annexing the Crimea um, about ten years ago, where would he have stopped? And this is so redolent. I mean, actually, it was the Prince Wales there was the king who pointed this out when Crimea was invaded. And he got a lot of stick for it. He said this is redolent of the 1930s when Germany invaded bits and pieces for more living space. The arguments were so sinisterly similar that Putin was using, and then he went back for more, not expecting the West to say no. The West did say no, and this has stopped him. He is not now going to invade Estonia or Poland uh, or any of the other neighboring countries. And this has massively increased our global security. It has also have been very helpful in terms of persuading China of the limits of what it can do. That doesn't mean we should ignore China because China has been building up alliances in the Middle East. It's got Saudi Arabia talking to Iran. We should be very concerned about that. We should be yes, very should. concerned about the way our relationships in the Middle East are deteriorating. Uh, and actually the US, Biden, has been um, not good in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. The irony is that for all of the criticism, Trump actually was far more effective in the Middle East, uh, uh, I think, than the current president. 
And Trump was amazingly effective in the Middle East. Uh, and um, I saw uh, in the UK uh, the ambassador from the UAE. And he said to me, was I aware that it was easier for somebody from the UAE to get into Israel than to get into the United Kingdom because of our visa and passport control? And that was Trump. That was Trump who brought them together, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. We've got, a, you know, obviously uh, an approaching presidential election in America, and what happens there is very important to the rest of us. I sometimes wonder whether the election of our prime minister in Australia is as important as who the Americans elect as their president. Uh, it's not an insignificant matter. The issue that I'd be interested in your views on is that we are picking up and you've already alluded to this, a certain weariness in America about global involvement. They get very little thanks for it. We expect them to be there whenever there's a problem. And then we criticize them uphill and downhill all the time. You can, I don't blame them for sometimes thinking, why do we bother, to be honest? But we can't afford that attitude. I worry, I wonder whether it worries you, that the next presidential campaign in America may very well feed isolationist views, which would be worrying in the context of an uncertain globe. It is always a feature of American politics, and it's particularly always a feature uh, of Congress, isn't it, that most senators and uh, most um, members of the House of Representatives are interested, quite rightly, in their constituents and don't like foreign engagements, and that's been true for a long time. So it's presidents who have to lead the way in foreign policy, and presidents have considerable leeway in what they can do under the US Constitution. But Donald Trump, when he was president, um, wanted a realignment. I mean, he wanted, to go back to your question on Ukraine, uh, Germany and France to pay more for the defense of Europe. Not an entirely unreasonable thing to ask for. It is, it is difficult. We need American engagement, um, and we have to be very careful that there is a tendency for um, non-American journals to be very dismissive, and politicians, of American political figures who may then be leaders of the free world. We have to be quite careful about what we say, even if what goes on in American politics is very surprising from a UK or an Australian perspective. I'd be very interested in just uh, teasing out some of um, uh, your own... Uh, views on a couple of matters. Lord Sumption, in one of these consultations, talked about this being the age of disengagement. And he talked about the staggering fall off in the number of card-carrying members of the major political parties, for example. And that's certainly true in my country as well. At every level you hear it, school boards can't get people who are prepared to go on. The sporting clubs have trouble. The local shows can't find young people coming through. Um, and right up to the top level, the political parties find sometimes now uh, that uh, there are very few people who want to take the job on. When I left and it was a safe seat, uh, there were only three people when I'd run 20 years before that. There were 12 who wanted the, jo the job. When, when John Howard had first run for his seat, there were 33 candidates. The age of non-engagement. Non, non Do you see that as a... As a, as a, a, a how do we counter that? How do we get people saying, I want to contribute, I need to contribute, there's something I can do and it, I should do it? It's really interesting how things have changed. Um, why does anybody take on any voluntary trusteeship? Because if you were asked 20 years ago, somebody would say to you, John, will you be a trustee at this body? And you'd say, yeah, I'm a bit light in this mind. Now, what will they say? They'll say, will you apply and send in a CV and be interviewed by a couple of teenagers to see whether you're suitable to um, go onto this body? Uh, then will you do some course on diversity and inclusion to see if you're suitable for it? Oh, and by the way, here are all the liabilities that you take on by joining this body. And people think, well, no, no, I'm doing this as a favour. I'm not doing this because I need it as a CV point. I'm doing it because this body needs somebody. I, and why does anyone take on being chairman of the BBC in the UK anymore? Most of them end up being forced out, having to retire for one reason or another. They get no political support when they get into difficulties. Uh, they get paid very little for it compared to jobs of similar size in the private sector. Um, and their reputations get trashed by the end of it. Why would anyone do that? 
And so you, you've got a, a sort of societal pressure against engagement. Why don't people join political parties? I suppose they've got other things to do. I mean, there, there are more various forms of entertainment. Um, I'm perhaps more worried about participation in elections. How do we keep vote uh, voter numbers up? I know, know you have compulsory voting, yes. which I'm not in favour of. I think it is a freedom not to vote as much as it's a freedom to vote. That, I think, is easier. I think people vote when it matters. So in the Scottish independence re referendum, you had the highest voting level since the 1950s. In the um, Brexit referendum, you had the highest voting level since the 1990s. When people think it matters, they will turn out to vote. And that's for politicians to make happen. But with the more general engagement, I think you've just got to make things easy for people again. Um, David Cameron had this thing about the big society, which I quite liked as an idea. The problem was it had to be new. Whereas what I wanted was those people who were doing Coronation Street parties just to be able to do them, rather than have to register with the council, tell the police they were closing the roads, put an advert up. If on the day of the coronation you found the odd road through a village was closed, did that really matter? Couldn't we just be a bit more flexible, a bit lighter touch? But you've stepped up out of conviction, whatever the obstacles, and sometimes in the face of hostility to your views, you have stepped up to your great credit. What drives you? Oh, well, I think politics is extraordinarily interesting. And I think that the country can be better governed. And I think I have something that I can contribute to that. I think conservative ideas work. We need people who believe in them and are willing to um, articulate them and put them as powerfully as they can. But I confess I enjoy doing it as well. Uh, and um, when, when people say to me, well, what about the intrusion and this and that and the next thing and Twitter not always being uh, entirely um, adulatory, um, I point out that I chose to do it. And I didn't have to choose to do it. You're well known as a man of, of strong Catholic convictions. You will have been subjected, uh, I can take this for granted, uh, I was, uh, uh, to this sort of line that you should leave your religious views behind when you enter the cabinet room, as though anybody can leave their worldview behind. But that has not uh, discouraged you from being very open and very honest about your views? No, I, I mean, religion is not party political in this country. We're not like America, that um, uh, America is in this extraordinary position that if you're a Republican, uh, you um, have to be anti-abortion and pro-capital punishment. Uh, I'm anti-both. Uh, and I, I, I think it's, it's fascinating how um, US politics has created this uh, um, bifurcation. Um, but I think that the issues of life are of extraordinary importance. It worries me, saddens me, that we live in a culture of death, and that is death of the newborn and it's death of the ill, uh, with euthanasia being increasingly um, common in civilized countries. Uh, and I think this is wrong. It's not a party political matter, but I think it's really important to speak out about it. I think it's wrong for moral reasons, but I also think it's wrong for practical reasons too. On the issue uh, of ethics, you've commented, I think, that there's a problem with moral relativism. And indeed, I think more broadly, there's a problem, if I can put it this way, that if there's no authority over government, if there's no God, if there's no absolute rights and wrong, then government becomes God. And principle is thrown out the door and everything becomes about power. But can you just elaborate on what you mean when you say there are issues and shortcomings in the concept of moral relativism? I think your point on power is absolutely the heart of it. In the Westminster system, Parliament can legislate on absolutely anything that it wishes to legislate on. But that doesn't mean that all its legislation will be legitimate. It, it, and this is actually the argument that Henry VIII um, found himself in with Thomas More. Thomas More was saying that there is a natural law and that Parliament cannot override this natural law. And I think that must be true, that there must be limits even to what a democratic Parliament can uh, vote for. It, it can't abolish the family, for example, even though the state has always been in competition with the family because the family is a power block, the greatest power block against the state. 
why the state uh, is to some extent jealous of the family. So I think there are overriding principles that um, you can't change by statute law. Moral rel relativism, um, I, mean, I suppose the problem is it's all relative to what you mean, isn't it? That, that uh, what are you trying to get at with moral relativism? Are there no absolutes? Are there no fundamentals? And I think there are some fundamentals, and I think one of them uh, is life. I admire your courage, and I know that uh, I'm not alone in that, and you've been very generous with your time. We were very kind. It, I have very little courage. It, it's very easy in UK politics saying what you think uh, if you're on the right. The people who have the real courage are um, people like um, uh, the, the lady who ran for the leadership of the SNP, who on a party of the left expressed similar views uh, because she was absolutely pilloried for that. And it was thought that somebody of her views could not stand for a, quote, a progressive party. Now, on the right, there is much more tolerance. The, the, the right in modern times is the party of tolerance, whereas the left has become intolerant. Extraordinary, really, that, isn't it? Um, there's a lot of truth to the old saying that uh, the right thinks the left is misguided and the left thinks that the right is evil. Yeah, I'm afraid that's true. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so very much. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm sorry I had to go to the House of Commons midway through the interview and come back again. <laughs>